narrow back alleys around Bradford's university were sealed off tonight as police made a detailed search of the area. The body was found by a patrolling officer, well hidden behind a low stone wall at the back of a large terraced house in the city's bedsit area. So Jim Hobson's new team of policemen has now taken over the Ripper inquiry. And already they claim to have had a pile of new information from the public. But they warn women who've been going out armed with knives and sharpened steel coats that they do risk arrest for carrying offensive weapons. I just see you as a beast with no feelings and you're a coward. Why do you come up and stalk young girls, innocent girls as well? You come up from behind them, they don't have a chance. You're not a man, you're a beast. Police believe it may have lain unnoticed there since Saturday. Ripper squad detectives from both Yorkshire and Manchester were quickly called to the scene. Tonight, the Home Office pathologist who's dealt with all 11 Ripper victims, Professor David G, was carrying out an examination of the body. Jane was a beautiful girl. You took life from her. You destroyed her family in one way or another. Her father just deteriorated. You're not a man. You're despicable. I despise you intensely. Tonight, one hospital in Leeds is on red alert after telephone threats that one of the nurses there would be the Ripper's 14th victim. Oh, you can hit their headlines, all right, but um, it's nothing to be proud of. I think that you do. And uh, I just don't know how you can sleep at night. He has already killed two women in this central area of Bradford and attacked one other. I understand there are similarities in the way that this woman has died. A deep sense of fear and resentment is built up in this Yorkshire community after five years of fruitless police inquiries into these brutal murders. It's hard to convey. You are the lowest of the low. Following the tape-recorded message from the man they believed to be the Ripper, in which he'd warned that he might strike again in September or October. He was murdered in 1977. He is the question in relation to the Yorkshire Ripper murders. Like these uh, chappies, perfectly respectable. We build about his normal everyday business without giving him the indication but he is the man responsible it is anticipated that he will appear before the court in Dewsbury tomorrow 21 months ago Wilma McCann was savagely murdered in these streets since then four other women have met a similar death and one has been horribly injured is it fair then to say that the general hunt for the so-called Yorkshire Ripper is now being wound down but from this moment on right all six women have been attacked in the so-called red light areas of Leeds and Bradford the Chapel Town and Manningham districts all but one of the victims were what the police have described as women of easy virtue they weren't professional prostitutes I tell you that we are absolutely delighted with developments at this stage this is the death cast and this is the yorkshire ripper hello and welcome to the death cast i am your host best-selling author ian totten and i'd like to thank you for joining me this week as we prepare to take our first of quite a few deep dives into the yorkshire ripper case once again, we are still in England, where we've been for the last few weeks. Much like the Moores murders, this particular case is one of the most infamous in the United Kingdom. Before we get into things, however, I have my normal plugs. If you'd like to follow me or the show on social media, you can find me on Facebook, Instagram, and me we just search out either Ian Totten author or the death cast if you would like to find me on Twitter you can go to at Corpse Creek follow along there if you would like to find any of my works just go to Amazon or Audible and search out Ian Totten my newest release Maggie just came out in audiobook format. You can also find it paperback, hardcover, and ebook. 
you want to join up on the mailing list, just go to CorpseCreekPublishing.com, click the sign up button, put in your information, and you'll be all set. While there, please consider buying me a cup of coffee or a pack of smokes by clicking on the donate button. Again, no amount is too small and certainly no amount is too large. For those of you who have donated to the show, my sincerest thanks. If you enjoy the show, please consider leaving a five-star review on your favorite podcast app. All five-star reviews that have any form of text associated with them are read out on the air. And lastly, a quick plug. A very good friend of mine recently lost someone who was rather important in their life, a young woman by the name of Jamie. Jamie ran an animal rescue in North Carolina called Day One Animal Rescue Incorporated. It's a not-for-profit animal rescue. Again, this young woman died suddenly last month. However, her animal rescue is still up and running. Uh, Other people who worked for the rescue have taken over and are attempting to continue with her dream. So if you're an animal lover, really quickly, I would just like to ask all of my listeners to consider going to PayPal and typing in Day One Animal Rescue and making a donation to help keep this young woman's memory alive. Again, that's Day One Animal Rescue. You'll find a link to their PayPal in the show notes. Alright, now that all of that is out of the way, get yourself something to drink, find a nice comfy chair, kick back and relax. I've got my coffee, I've got my cigarettes. Let's go to Yorkshire. The Yorkshire River case, much like the Atlanta child murders, which I covered last week, is one of those cases filled with extreme levels of incompetence by police forces. As you heard in that somewhat extended trailer, the lead investigator, when they actually caught the ripper, was a man by the name of Peter Sutcliffe, stated that they were absolutely delighted And the reason for this delight was the fact that the people in the area of Yorkshire where the Ripper was stalking his victims had really lost all hope in the police's ability to solve this particular series of crimes. And we're going to get into that more as we get into the case But I figure that is a good place to start going into it, knowing that the police bungled this thing at every turn imaginable. And realistically, it was only a bit of luck on their part that Sutcliffe was caught when he was. On the night... Of July 5th, 1975, a woman by the name of Anna Rogliski was walking alone in the small town of Kigley when she was suddenly struck from behind by what would later be determined to have been a ball-peed hammer. After being struck multiple times, her stomach was slashed open before her killer unexplicably fled the scene. It would later be learned that the assailant was disturbed by a nearby neighbor. Rogolsky survived this assault, but would end up needing numerous operations to repair the damage done to both her stomach as well as to her skull. She later stated, I've been afraid to go out much because I feel people are staring and pointing at me. The whole thing is making my life a misery. I sometimes wish I had died in the attack. Obviously, this statement was given after 
it became apparent to authorities that a serial killer was stalking their towns. But it is apparent that this assault had a devastating lifelong impact on the woman. A little over a month later, on August 15th, a woman by the name of Olive Smelt was walking through the streets of Halifax, England, when she too was attacked, being struck over the head with a hammer before being slashed with a knife, although this time the knife attack was just below her butt. There was a difference, however, in this particular assault, as the assailant struck up a brief conversation with the woman, making a statement about the weather, and when her guard was down, hitting her over the head. Again, the assailant fled, this time being driven off by the approaching headlights of a car. Olive survived the assault, although, like the previous victim, she too suffered severe physical, mental, and emotional trauma. Later, Smelt would tell Deputy Superintendent Dick Holland that her attacker had a Yorkshire accent, although this information seems to have been completely ignored. And as the case would begin to unfold, the fact that neither of the towns that the victims were in contained a red light district was equally pushed to the side. Just 12 days later, on August 27th, a 14-year-old girl by the name of Tracy Brownie was walking along a deserted country lane in Silsden when she was attacked from behind. She was struck over the head at least five times with a hammer. As with Smelt, the attacker was scared off by approaching headlights of a car. As with the previous two assaults, the victim required numerous surgeries. In fact, he did so much damage to Brownie that she eventually ended up requiring brain surgeries. After Brownie's assault, it doesn't seem as though the man who would come to be known as the Yorkshire Ripper was very active. It could be that he believed he had possibly killed the girl and was going through a cooling off period, although it's more likely than not that his three failed attempts at taking a life had frightened him to the point that he feared that A, he wasn't any good at it, and B, that he was going to get caught if he continued to operate the way that he had been. There is also a very good chance that Brownie's assault was not reported in the local media as she was underage at the time of the assault, and Britain, like the United States, rarely, if ever, releases the name of an underage victim. On October 30th of 1975, a mother of four, Wilma McCann, was attacked in Leeds. She was hit from behind at least twice with a hammer, after which her attacker began to stab her brutally, quote unquote, a stab wound to the throat, two stab wounds below the right breast, three stab root wounds below the left breast, and a series of nine stab wounds about around the umbilicus. Unfortunately, Wilma did not survive this assault, and her killer ran off into the night to get away scot-free. However, along with the three previous attacks and now this murder, the police in Yorkshire, in the various districts, towns, what have you, began to take notice, and in fact, Wilma's death generated a considerable inquiry. At least 150 officers 
from the West Yorkshire Police conducted an estimated 11,000 interviews, although they failed to find any trace of who might be the culprit. To the best of our knowledge, Sutcliffe ended up taking an extended cooling off period after the murder of Wilma McCann. Until January 20, 1976, 42-year-old Emily Jackson had been forced into prostitution by her husband due to their financial difficulties. She was using the family's van that they also used for their roofing business to solicit clients. Jackson was soliciting outside of the Gaiety Pub on Round Hay Road when she was picked up and driven to the Manor Industrial Estate, which was about a half a mile from where they had been. This area, this Manor Industrial Estate, was filled with numerous empty and derelict buildings. Once away from prying eyes, Sutcliffe hit Emily in the head with the hammer before dragging her out of the van into a weed and refuse strewn empty lot, at which point he produced a sharpened screwdriver and proceeded to stab her 52 times. At one point, Sutcliffe became so enraged he stomped on her thigh and actually left an impression of his boot in her flesh. After the attack, the assailant fled the scene and disappeared back into the night. An important piece of information would be gleaned from this in that the killer wore a size 11 shoe. You might be thinking, wasn't her husband at all worried about her when she did not come home? Well, reality of this situation was the two of them had gone to this particular pub together, and he was to wait for her while she went outside and attempted to find John's. When she did not come back, however, her husband assumed that she had found a trick for the night and instead went home. Now, the next morning, a man showing up for work noticed something lying beneath a coat in an alleyway. And upon inspecting it, he found the badly mutilated corpse of a woman with her breasts exposed. At this point, the West Yorkshire police really began to take notice of the fact that there was obviously someone in the area who had a grudge against prostitutes. And they really started to amp up their investigation. However, it should be pointed out that the idea of serial killers was, for the most part, just that, even in, in 1976. Again, as I've talked about in other episodes, serial killers were something of an unknown commodity to police forces, and they were usually relegated to trashy novels and movies to have one actively stalking throughout your communities was a novel event that the West Yorkshire police were ill-equipped to tackle. On May 9th of 1976, a young woman by the name of Marcella Claxton was assaulted in the Round Hay Park, which is in Reeds. She was walking home from a party when a man pulled up beside the 20-year-old and offered her a ride home. 
accepting the offer, Claxton got in and they drove a short distance before she realized that she needed to urinate. Pulling to the side of the road, she got out from the vehicle and began to go to the bathroom when she was hit from behind with a hammer. Amazingly, Claxton survived the assault, although it should be noted that she was four months pregnant at the time of the attack, and due to the severity of the assault, she ended up miscarrying the baby as well as suffering numerous blackouts and depression. She underwent extensive surgeries in an attempt to repair the damage that had been done on her brain. This assault was reported to the police in Leeds, obviously. However, as with the other attacks, those the murders as well as the surviving victims, the West Yorkshire police really didn't do a whole lot to publicize any of this, which is understandable in one regard as they don't want to create a public panic, but on the other hand, you have the safety of the populace to think about, and if they don't know that someone is out there doing these kinds of things. They just go about their daily lives as though nothing is going on. After this assault on Claxton, it appears as though the Yorkshire River went into an extended cooling off period. I've read various things that have stated that it's believed that he may have gone into this cooling off period due to the fact that his last victim gave birth to a dead child not long after his attack, although personal opinion I believe it's more likely than not that he was active during this point in time and that either the people that he assaulted did not come forward to the police out of shame. Remember, too, he was also targeting prostitutes, and there is no love lost between them and law enforcement, regardless of what country you're in. It might also have been that he was just much better at concealing the bodies of any possible victims he had taken during that period of time. The next murder attributed to the Yorkshire Ripper would not take place until 1977. Now, it should be noted that there are varying dates given for when the woman was murdered slash her body was discovered, as well as discrepancies in the place of the body's discovery. Some sources list her date of death as the 5th of February 1977, while others list it as the 6th of January 1977. While the area where she was found is listed alternatively as Round Hay Park or Soldier's Field in Leeds. In any event, a man was out jogging when he spotted a body sitting behind a sports pavilion. It was lying face down on the dirt with the shirt opened. Upon arriving, police discovered that the victim's head had been shattered from behind with a hammer before the body was severely mutilated, either with a knife or a sharpened screwdriver. Upon looking through the woman's belongings, they noted that she was a known prostitute by the name of Irene Richardson, a 28-year-old known to live over on Cowper Street in Chapeltown, which she had left shortly after midnight. Some 
sources state that she had left her lodgings in order to go to a dance, while others do not give a reason as to why she had gone out that night, with some speculation being that she had actually gone out that night in order to earn a living. One bit of evidence that was able to be collected from the crime scene were tire tracks near the scene of the murder, which unfortunately for the investigators looking into Irene's murder, produced for them a massive list of suspects. As with the other attacks and murders, this one really didn't get much press coverage, and a large reason for that is that at this period in time, 1976, 1977, etc., prostitutes were really viewed as undesirables in Western countries. And this is reflected in the West Yorkshire Police Department's actions and attitudes towards these young women. The media also held a similar point of view wherein these crimes were almost victimless because the victims were prostitutes. Get more into the Yorkshire Ripper after this. Vortex. Maggie, the name was burned into Lieutenant Karo Joplonsky's mind like a brand and had been since the night of the fire. He doubted he would ever forget that night or how she had danced in the flames of her burning home. Maggie, who was she and why did no one in Kaya's Crossing seem interested in talking about her or her family? These were questions without answers. Quandaries that drove Carl on as he explored the darkest of the town's secrets, desperate to unravel the knots that tied everything together. Maggie, Carl felt haunted by a visage, even as the local reporter, George Murphy, told them of the blood-soaked history that lay along their path and the horrors that it held. None of it seemed real, and yet it was. The sacrifices, the screams, the pact with the nameless ones, and the hell that she had endured. Maggie, hers was a crime begging to be solved, and he and George are the only ones with enough heart to do it. The real question is, will they survive long enough to do it? Maggie, available 11, 30, 2021, in paperback and hardcover. Ebook pre-orders are now available at Amazon.com. Only from Corpse Creek Publishing. You have been warned. We are back by the book, Maggie. So while police were, I'm gonna, I can't even say diligently looking into these crimes, while they were investigating them, the public was largely unaware that a serial killer was in their midst. On April 23rd, 1977, a 32-year-old prostitute from Bradford by the name of Patricia Tina Atkinson was found dead inside of her flat. I have to assume that either a landlord or a neighbor called the police. When they went to investigate, they found her body head shattered, a 
severely mutilated, but they also found a boot print on her blanket, or rather, more specifically, on her sheets, which matched the boot print that they had taken off of a previous victim. At this point, the West Yorkshire police were really beginning to build a dossier on the murders and put them together. However, it was the next crime that really galvanized not only the police force, but the people of Yorkshire into action. On January 25th, 1977, Jane McDonald, age 16, went to a German-styled pub in Leeds to hang out with some friends. While she was there, she met a man and ended up making plans to meet him later in the week. However, when her friends left, McDonald realized that she had missed her last ride home. And she ended up walking towards her house. Shortly thereafter, around 2 a.m., she was walking down Reginald Street when an unknown assailant attacked her from behind. The next morning at roughly 9.45, a group of children who were playing in a playground discovered McDonald's body and after investigating it it was found that she had been hit from behind with a hammer before being stabbed multiple times as with the other victims this young woman's breasts were left exposed there was a new kink to this particular murder however as a broken beer bottle had actually been shoved into her chest This was information that was withheld from the public for obvious reasons. It concerns a minor, and it was extremely horrific. However, this particular murder really lit a fire underneath the West Yorkshire Police Department, but also beneath the affected communities as women began to speak out about the series of unsolved murders, not just speaking out amongst each other, but also to the news media, and it created something of a firestorm within Yorkshire. McDonald's murder is Sutcliffe's first known non-prostitute murder, but it was also his youngest known victim and because of this and the depiction that the media painted of her through newscasts and newspaper reporting the people of Yorkshire began to realize that any woman could be a victim of this particular individual the public also began to get enraged with the police department at this point because the police had it that McDonald was a good girl while the other women were bad girls or bad women because they were prostitutes and the people in Yorkshire really took umbrage with this rightfully so as they believed that it didn't matter what the individual's walk of life was they should all be treated the same in the eyes of the law and they should all be investigated as thoroughly as any other murder whether the person was a prostitute or not in a public appeal mcdonald's mother irene said how many more must die before people wake up and realize it could happen to someone they love i feel that if the victims had all been Sunday school teachers, the public would have come forward with clues and the man would have been found by now. One reporter 
was noted as stating that basically up until Jane McDonald's murder, the fear had only been felt among the working girl population of Yorkshire. But with Jane's murder, it spread to encompass everyone. And that really couldn't be further from the truth because after this point, the news coverage and the pressure put on the West Yorkshire police was extreme to say the least. Tips began to flood into the West Yorkshire police apartment after this murder and it got to the point that the floor that the investigation was being conducted out of in the West Yorkshire Police Department actually had to be reinforced to not only hold the weight of all of the personnel involved in the investigation, but also to handle the weight of all the evidence. And by evidence on this, I mean written statements from potential witnesses, people who made phone calls in. All of this was kept on index cards. And to put that into perspective, the Atlanta child murders, a lot of the information during that investigation was kept on index cards as well, and it wasn't an efficient system. This is one area where we really can't fault them in regards to that because computers were still in their infancy. The West Yorkshire police had such an overwhelming influx of information coming in at all hours of the day and night that it was very hard to index one person's name against another and say, hey, you know, two people have called in about this person. Three people have mentioned this person's name to us. Maybe we should check into it. That wasn't happening. The police were basically floundering beneath the amount of information they were being given. And as a consequence, they really weren't able to follow up on any real or potential leads that were sent into them. Meanwhile, the man that had become dubbed as the Yorkshire Ripper was still out on the streets stalking the young women who lived in the area. At some point in July of 1977, a woman by the name of Maureen Long, who was 42 years old, was assaulted in Bradford. The assailant was scared off, and Long was left for dead. And this assault is really indicative of how the entire investigation went. A witness gave police a statement and misidentified the make and model of the car he believed the suspect to have been driving. And as a result of this, over 300 police officers were out looking for this particular make and model. And they ended up taking over 12,000 statements, along with investigating tens of thousands of cars in an effort to find this one particular vehicle that the witness said that they had seen fleeing the scene. This isn't to take any heat off of the West Yorkshire Police Department, because I really do feel... I know that they would have, could have captured the man who was responsible for these crimes much sooner had they listened to outside sources and taken some steps, such as seeing if this particular vehicle that the witness said that they had seen was able to be equipped with the tires that were found in leads outside of the ballpark. To the best of my knowledge, they didn't follow this up and did not check 
cross reference to see if the you know phantom car was able to have these types of tires there was a lot there's a lot of stuff in this case just like that where the police completely overlooked a step in order to track down every bit of information that they were being given on october 1st 1977 a 20 year old prostitute by the name of Jean Jordan was murdered behind Manchester's Southern Cemetery. Jean's body would not be found for 10 days. And upon finding the body, the police discovered a rather unique clue in that Great Britain had recently issued new five pound notes and unlike the united states britain really really keeps track of their money where it's issued from what was sent where so they began to try and track back to discover where this woman might have come across this unique amount of money Later, after the suspect was captured, he did admit to having realized that he gave this prostitute the new five-pound note, and after attending a Christmas party that his family was throwing, he actually drove back to where he had left Jean's body and searched her, although he was unable to find the five-pound note anywhere on her person. This was one of those holdback items that police often do where they won't give out all of the information on a crime in the hopes that if they do get a suspect, they will be able to provide them with that piece of information that no one other than the killer would have. The police were able to trace back this note to a number of branches of the Midland Bank in Shipley and Bingley. Because of this, police were able to zone in on about 8,000 individuals who might have received the five-pound note inside of their pay packet. And over the next three months, they interviewed an estimated 5,000 of these individuals, one of whom was a man by the name of Peter Sutcliffe. However, unfortunately for the police as well as future victims, Sutcliffe had an alibi in that he was at a family party for most of the night, and they crossed him off their list and moved along to the next suspect. And one of those suspects is an individual that I am something of an expert on who many of my listeners may not have heard of or may only know sparing details of. And that is Sir James Vincent Seville, also known as Jimmy Seville. And I say I'm something of an expert on him. In the loosest of terms, I've been researching Seville heavily for the last, oh, roughly five years, ever since I have became aware of who he was. If there's a police report out there, a report from the BBC, a newspaper article, a book written about him, chances are I have it and have read it for a aborted book that I was planning to write a few years ago concerning him. Why do I bring up Jimmy Seville, though? Very quickly in a nutshell, Jimmy Seville was Great Britain's Dick Clark. Television shows, radio programs, you name it, commercials, he was everywhere. He was known as something of an eccentric. Later, after his death, 
but also during his lifetime there was accusations that he was a serial child predator. He was something of an eccentric, odd duck. And according to Leeds Police, he was known as someone who frequented prostitutes. With the body of Irene Richardson, who, if you'll remember, was the first murder that took place in 1977. Being found near Seville's apartment, this was Seville's primary residency throughout the majority of his adult life. There was also another victim who we have not gotten to yet that was found nearby Seville's apartment, and police considered him a suspect so much so that they actually had a dentist do dental imprints of Seville's teeth in an effort to try and match him to bite marks found on Irene Richardson's breasts. There is a conspiracy theory out there that Seville and the man who was eventually convicted, Peter Sutcliffe, were accomplices in crime. Part of this stems from the fact that Sutcliffe actually named Jimmy Seville in his interrogations, but he didn't name him in the way most people envision he did. In fact, really what he said was, oh, I left her body near here, which I later found out was where Jimmy Seville lived. In fact, where Irene Richardson's body was left, were you standing in Seville's apartment, you could actually see the body. But it came from other things as well, namely that when Sutcliffe was committed to Broadmoor Hospital, which is a mental institution for the criminally insane in Great Britain. Seville, who was known for his charity work, really became a friend of Peter Sutcliffe. And that's the type of individual that Seville was. He would befriend the lowliest of the low, provided there was something in it for him. In the case of the Yorkshire Ripper, it was a guarantee that his name was going to continue to be in print because Jimmy Seville was one of those individuals, one of those stars who his public image was the most important thing in his life to him. That, coupled with where the bodies were, has led to a conspiracy theory that Sutcliffe and Seville were working in tandem to target and murder prostitutes. So much so that the police in West Yorkshire have actually looked into that particular avenue since Seville's death in 2012. Although I have been unable to find any information to state whether they believe it to be true or not beyond one of the former detectives stating he believes that Sutcliffe had accomplices and that one of them was more likely than not Seville. Anyways, now that we're finished with that little tangent, we'll get back to the crimes of the Yorkshire Ripper. In December of 1976, another prostitute in Leeds by the name of Marilyn Moore, who was 25 years old, was attacked and struck with a hammer. However, Marilyn Moore survived her assault, and she was able to provide the police with what is called a photo fit. In Great Britain at that time, I'm not certain if it's still this way, they didn't use composite sketches. They had an artist, for lack of a better term, who would help the 
you know, victim pick out facial features from a book of thousands or millions, you know, did the eyes look like these eyes, or they look like this kind of eye, okay, they look like this kind of eye, well, here's a whole slew of them that are similar to this, and they would build a composite of the perpetrator out of this. Well, Marilyn gave the police a photo fit that very closely matched that of Peter Sutcliffe, so much so that he was again questioned by police and released. She also gave them a very good description of the car that her attacker had been driving, and surprise, surprise, this car matched other vehicles that were known to have been seen in the red light districts, and it also matched a vehicle that Peter Sutcliffe drove. In January of 1978, the police picked up the trail of the new five-pound note again, and wouldn't you know who won the pony, they ended up interviewing a man by the name of Peter Sutcliffe again. I just want to say, you're going to see this time and time again, and this shows the ineptitude of the task force in that they interviewed Peter Sutcliffe multiple times over the years, yet they were never able to pin him down as a real suspect, let alone get him for any murders. Sutcliffe was able to get himself out of that particular bind so that he could go on later in the month to strike again. This time, he killed a young woman by the name of Yaban Pearson, who was 21 years old. He struck Yvonne in the head multiple times with the ball-peen hammer before jumping up and down on her chest. This was in kind of a field, and there was a discarded couch nearby. He pulled some of the stuffing, which has been described as horsehair, out of this couch and stuffed it into her mouth before placing Yvonne's body underneath this discarded sofa. Subsequently, Yvonne's body would not be found until March. Not long after this, roughly 10 days later, the Yorkshire River was in Huddersfield, where he encountered an 18-year-old prostitute by the name of Helen Ritka. Helen had been picked up and driven to a railroad yard. When she exited the man's vehicle, he immediately sprung into action, striking her in the head with the ball-peen hammer before stripping her naked. In a sense, he pulled her bra and pushed the turtleneck she was wearing up to expose her breasts, which was becoming something of a trademark or M.O. for the Yorkshire Ripper. After which, he stabbed her multiple times in the chest and stomach before driving off. Helen's body was found two to three days later, and her name was added to the growing list. Sources differ on what came next. Some stated that the Yorkshire River went quiet after murdering Helen, while others state that in March or April, he murdered another prostitute by the name of Vera Millward in a car park of the Manchester Royal Infirmary. So basically what that means is this woman who was 40 years old, was murdered just outside of a hospital. Again, sources differ. Most link this death to him, while others do not. To the best of everyone's knowledge, the Yorkshire Ripper did not strike again for roughly a year 
and for a serial killer of Sutcliffe's voracious appetite, that seems extremely odd. We know he had cooling off periods, but for him to go for such extended periods of time without murder, a year in between, it really doesn't fit his psychological profile. However, during the period of time after Vera Millward's murder, it is known that Sutcliffe's mother died, and profilers as well as psychologists have said that most serial killers will not stop killing unless they're either caught, they die, or a significant moment in their life happens that causes them to need to stop. And it could very well be that Sutcliffe's mother dying was just the thing that he needed in order to stop and control his impulses while he dealt with that situation in his personal life. There are other serial killers, though, too, who, given a similar situation, will actually pick up the pace of their killings due to this outside force coming into their life. In Sutcliffe's case, the death of his mother, it is known that he later stated that during this period of time, he really could not control himself and all he could think about was going out and finding another woman to kill. So it is very likely that he did murder people during this year-long period of time that we just are not aware of. Again, Sutcliffe really only admitted to the things that were brought to him. He never gave much in the way of information outside of that. Part of me has to wonder if that's because he was taking any victim that presented itself and that these victims were possibly quite a bit younger than his known victims. I'm talking, you know, 10, 11, 12 years old. It is a very reasonable assumption to make that this could be the case and that he did not want to talk about those particular murders. On April 4th, 1979, A bank clerk by the name of Josephine Whitaker was walking home near the town Moore in Halifax. And if you'll remember from last week's episode where we discussed the Moore's murders, the Moors are these rather large expanses of swampy, hill-infested land. So this 19-year-old woman is walking home when she is assaulted, beaten about the head with a hammer, stabbed. Now, supposedly there was new forensic evidence that was able to be taken from this particular crime scene. However, here's where things take a twist in this case. The West Yorkshire Police received a tape recording sent to Assistant Chief Constable George Oldfield. Remember, this is the 70s, and tapes were a very rare commodity, especially this particular tape, as it was found to be the type that was sent out to radio stations as part of promotion for a band's new single. Tapes were very expensive at this period of time, and for an individual to have one of these cassettes, many felt, and still do, that the individual responsible for this tape more likely than not had a connection to the entertainment, specifically the radio DJ industry. Again, we get that little piece, that little nugget that ties into the Jimmy Seville 
conspiracy theory as Seville started out as a DJ, he still was a DJ at this point, and it's not only possible, it is an absolute certainty that he would have had access to these types of tapes. I'm not saying that he was involved in it, in fact, I don't believe he was personally, but it's just a nice little coincidence. Anyway, this tape that was sent to Chief Constable George Oldfield contained a recording of a man's voice with what has been described as a Geordie accent. If you are unfamiliar with a Geordie accent, go listen to a, an interview with Brian Johnson of ACDC. It's also been called a Wareside accent. Some people don't understand the importance of this, but that part of the country is quite a bit more north than the Leeds, Manchester, Yorkshire area, and they have a much more brogue, thick accent. The tape said, in part, I'm Jack. I see you're having no luck catching me. I have the greatest respect for you, George, but Lord, you're no nearer catching me now than four years ago when I started. Armed with this, the police began to search for an area where they thought that the man might be living, and they narrowed it down to Castle t- to the Castle Town area of Sunderland, Tyne, and Ware. The media dubbed this individual as Wareside Jack, and the police really dug in on this. I believe they spent at least three months actively searching for this individual. It didn't help matters that at least two letters were sent to both the Yorkshire Police and the Daily Mail. There are conflicting reports regarding these letters. Some say they were sent the prior year, while others state that they were in fact sent in 1979. In either event, The letters coupled with this rare tape being sent into the police really threw them way off the mark. And it would be decades before the truth of this part of the case was revealed. Unless you believe the conspiracy theorists, then it's never been revealed. But anyways... In 2005, a man by the name of John Humble, who was an an unemployed alcoholic who lived about a mile from Castletown, Sunderland, was found to have been both the voice heard on the recording as well as the man who wrote and sent the letters. They did this through DNA testing the envelopes that the letters came in and he was charged with attempting to pervert the course of justice on March 21st of 2006 he was sentenced to 8 years on this charge one interesting thing from these notes which he signed Jack the Ripper is that references were made in these letters to the murder of a 26-year-old woman by the name of Joan Harrison up in Preston in November of 1975. The reason this is interesting is Sutcliffe was not known to have gone to that area, but this other individual, John Humble, was known to be in that area. Whether he committed the crime or not, however, is a mystery as John Humble died on July 30th, 2019 at the age of 69. We are going to leave the case of the Yorkshire Ripper here for this week. There is only one more murder to discuss and then we have a whole lot to talk about in regards to the known perpetrator as well as fallout that came 
from the trial, conviction, and subsequent events. I hope you enjoyed this week's episode. Again, if you did, please like and subscribe on your favorite podcast app. Leave a five-star review. Until next week, I'm your host, best-selling author Ian Totten. The Death Cast is a production of Corpse Creek Publishing. Stay morbid. <laughs>